Hey there friends and neighbors, I'm the Mad Hatter, and welcome to the first episode of a new series of movie reviews on this channel that I like to call, What's All the Fuss About? This is where I'll take a look at the American Film Institute's 2007 picks for the 100 greatest films of all time. I'll watch and review all 100 of these films in order to determine why it made the list of the 100 greatest films of all time, and also, even though these films have already been reviewed to death by much more talented critics, I'll give my own take on these films as well. So I can think of no better place to start than the end of the list. <clears throat> the 100th greatest film of all time, Ben-Hur. Remember, you're a wizard. Well, on second thought, let's go ahead and come on. Oh, you're still a princess. Time travel, as you wish. You're a Roman, and I'm a Jew. Whose life you once saved. The best thing I ever did. Judah. This is going to be a very difficult province to govern. I'm going to need help. Your help. Your advice. You want my advice? Yes, I do. Withdraw your legions. Give us our freedom. It's interesting because the subtitle for this film is A Tale of the Christ. So, yeah, this is a religious epic, but for all that, we only actually see Jesus a total of about four times during the course of this film. And each and every one of those times, we're either seeing him from the back or from the front in such a way that his face is obscured. So we never actually see his face, we never actually hear his voice, but we know exactly who it is. The real protagonist of the story, though, is the title character, Judah Ben-Hur, a Jewish nobleman who lives with his mother and his sister. The film begins with Judah reuniting with an old childhood friend by the name of Masala, a Roman. And if you know anything about the history of this time period, you know that the Jews and the Romans didn't really get along so well. Masala basically wants Judah to help him to keep the Jewish rebels under control, but this request goes a bit too far and it ends with a confrontation between the two friends. Eventually this confrontation leads to Judah, his mother, and his sister being accused of attempting to murder a Roman governor. But before he's sent away, he vows revenge on Masala when he returns. And this film is basically the story of that journey. Now as the subtitle says, it is a tale of the Christ, and at the very beginning of Judah's journey into slavery, he encounters Jesus. This small act of kindness gives Judah the strength to keep going through all the years that he's in slavery and all the years that it takes him to return home. Ultimately, the theme of this film is forgiveness, which of course was also a big theme in Jesus' teachings. The focus is on how Jesus affected other people and how other people took his teachings and used them in the world. And that's what we see here as we watch Judah struggle with his feelings of revenge. And even though it is a biblical epic, it's only a biblical epic in the sense that it takes place during biblical times. So it's not really preachy and it just shows you the facts and allows you to make your own judgment. So obviously I like this film quite a lot, but what is all the fuss about? When this film came out in 1959, it was huge. And not just because it was an epic film. I mean, this was during a time when epic films were fairly commonplace. He had stories like Gone with the Wind, The Ten Commandments, Spartacus, and some other epic films out there. And a lot of them did make the top 100 list as well, but this was a big deal even for the time. It won 11 Academy Awards, a record that is still only matched by Titanic and The Return of the King, and even then they just tied it. It won Best Picture of the Year, Best Direction, Best Actor, and Best Supporting Actor. And in my mind, this is made all the more impressive by the fact that this movie was created during a time when there wasn't any kind of computer-generated anything. So all the people that you see, all the action that you see, all the sets, it's all real. Well, at least as real as it would be if you were, say, watching this on stage. Obviously, there are still tricks here and there, but it's as real as cinema gets. And as I was watching this movie, it occurred to me that movies like this don't get made anymore. I mean, first of all, the film is three and a half hours long, and nowadays we think two hours is pushing it for a movie. But the film is long for a couple of reasons. First of all, it is an epic film, and so just because of the vast scope of everything that's happening, it has to be long in order to cover everything. 
But second, and more importantly, the pacing. This is not what you would call a fast-paced film. The only really fast-paced part of the film is the famous chariot race in the middle. Everything else moves pretty slowly, largely because there are a lot of pauses in the dialogue and a lot of instances where seemingly nothing is happening. If a movie like this were made today, it would be vastly different because in movies today, we have to have something happening all the time. There has to be some kind of snappy dialogue or some kind of impressive action scene or something happening. There are just too many silences where all we see are a couple of still shots of the two characters looking at each other. But it's not that there's nothing happening in those instances, it's just that the things that are happening are really subtle. Those moments are necessary for this film to really work because it allows you a moment to take in the vast scope of what's happening. In reality, there's very little dialogue in this movie at all. A lot of it is just allowing the characters to act silently. Again, the one fast-paced scene is the chariot race, and even that would have been done differently today. You'll notice as you watch the chariot race that there's no music in the background, so there's nothing extra to add to the excitement of the scene. The excitement of the scene is derived by the fact that what you're seeing is actually really exciting, and the effort that they put into shooting that scene really shows. This film, I think even more than any I've seen, exemplifies the fact that movies are a visual medium. And this doesn't just mean having a lot of impressive eye candy type visuals, but actually allowing the visuals to tell the story. It uses the adage of show don't tell extremely well. Now, please don't take this as an old fuddy duddy's rant about how, oh, movies aren't like this anymore, and movies suck now, and this is how movies should be. That's not what I'm saying at all. I just think that it's really interesting to look at the evolution of cinema in a film like this and a film like, say, The Lord of the Rings. The Lord of the Rings is a long epic story too, but the difference here is it's actually split up into three movies. Now this isn't to say that Ben-Hur doesn't have its problems. The acting isn't always spectacular, and to be honest, I was a little underwhelmed by the ending. And you do actually have to be able to devote three and a half hours to sitting down and watching a movie, which, let's face it, it is not very easy for us to do. But watching this movie, I can definitely feel the effort, I can see why it won all the awards that it did, and I can see why the American Film Institute picked it as one of the greatest films of all time. So in my opinion, the fuss is definitely merited, and on the worth meter, I would give this a worth renting. I'm not going to go so far as to say that I enjoyed it enough that I'm going to go out and buy it, but I might rent it once or twice and watch it again. So that does it for my review of Ben-Hur. The next review is going to be on Toy Story, and until next time, this is Matt Hatter saying, one down, 99 to go. Yeah.